Welcome to the course on Shakespeare's plays. We are going to read his plays as performance texts and refer to drama in the sense of theater. Elizabethan uh, drama did not flourish in a vacuum. It has roots going all the way back to Greece. So I want to start off uh, with a discussion of uh, the Western dramatic tradition. To do this, I'll have to take you way back, way back to ancient Greece, where it all began, with the spring festival called the Dionysia. Let, let me spell Dionysia on the board. The Dionysia, as you know, was a competition with each playwright submitting three plays and a satyr plays. Uh, uh, don't confuse uh, satyr with satire because we are also going to talk about uh, satire in this course. This is how we spell this satyr. And a satyr is a half man, half goat, and these are uh, funny short interludes uh, which probably added spice uh, to the uh, performance. Okay? Your famous tragedians, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, were among uh, uh, the competitors whose works just miraculously happened to survive. Uh, next to the three heavyweights in tragedy, in comedy, we have Aristophanes, who wrote satirical uh, plays on any and every subject, including politics, education, the generation conflict, war, and last but not least, on the three famous tragedians whose names we've just mentioned. Each town, large or small, had its own theater both on mainland Greece and in Asia Minor, in Anatolia. Uh, what were these theaters like? You probably know as well as I do if you have traveled in Turkey at all. Uh, Greek theaters and Hellenistic theaters following the Greeks were built into the side of a, a hill. The, the ones in Ephesus and Priene are wonderful examples, and the one you see now is the one at Ephesus. How could you tell a Greek theater from a Roman one? That's easy, and we have a lot of them also in Turkey. Roman theaters were meant to be feats of uh, good engineering. So uh, instead of using the slope of a hill, they were built up uh, on the level ground, and Aspendos and Side theaters are fine examples. Uh, you see the one in Aspendos, which is still in use today. The architecture was similar uh, whether uh, the theater is Greek or Roman. At the back is the Scania building, from which an actors entered and exited. And uh, the performance space is called the orchestra. The, uh, the chorus stands along the sides of the orchestra. The seats closest to the orchestra were, of course, reserved for men. Women sa sat in sort of the middle rows, and the slaves sat at the very back, okay? Uh, in such huge theaters, and some of them were really huge, uh, seeing and hearing uh, could be a problem, although uh, both Greek and Roman theaters are famed for their good acoustics. So, uh, actors wore masks, and uh, I'm sure you are familiar with uh, both masks. The tragedy mask in which the eyes and the mouth uh, 
uh, droop downwards and the comedy mask in which the eyes and the mouth uh, stretch upwards. And in fact, uh, they, are, they are familiar signs uh, on any theater brochure. Uh, the, the mask, whether it was a tragedy mask or a comedy mask, was very useful because actors projected their voices through the opening for the mouth. Another uh, convention was the kind of shoe the actors wore. Okay? For tragedy, they wore the baskin. Which is the high shoe. And for comedy, they wear the sock, which is the low shoe. And uh, the, the term uh, sock and baskin are shorthand for drama. Okay? Uh, uh, remember that performances took place in daylight. All actors were male. The orchestra space was bare uh, with hardly any stage property or stage furniture. Uh, wh why am I telling you all this? Because you will see these conventions in Shakespeare's theater too. Although Greek dram dramatic practice was available to 16th century Europe and England only through Roman models, all these things had a way of continuing. Okay, so uh, let's uh, turn now from the physical space of the theater uh, to the play texts themselves. How about the roots of Elizabethan and Jacobian playtexts, that is, the drama of the English Renaissance? Let's look at comedy first, since in 16th century England, comedies outnumbered tragedies three to one. A, a major influence, of course, is uh, uh, Greek new comedy via Roman imitations. Uh, you probably remember that Greek drama, uh, Greek comedy is divided into uh, three phases. Old comedy, Aristof Aristophanes, the satirical tradition. There must also have been a middle comedy about which we know nothing because no texts are extant. And then new comedy uh, and Menander, uh, the only playwright whose uh, fragments of whose text we have is Menander, but we are lucky uh, all the way through the 19th century and up to 2003, uh, new fragments of Menander's text uh, have been found. So we have a pretty good idea uh, about his subjects, the kind of characters he used and this and that. And uh, the kind of comedy he wrote is comedy of manners. What is comedy of manners? Comedy of manners uh, pulls the mask off our social faces to expose the truth underneath. Okay? Uh, why no longer political comedy, but uh, you know, social comedy, comedy of manners? Well, uh, this is no longer the Athens in which Ar uh, Aristophanes uh, wrote. Uh, at, in Aristophanes' time, uh, uh, Athenian democracy allowed political satire. Uh, a, a hundred years later, uh, politics was a very dangerous subject, so authors carefully avoided it. Okay. So, uh, Roman comedy took as model uh, Greek new comedy in imitation of Menander. In turn, Elizabethan play playwrights borrowed from Plautus and Terence everything that Plautus and Terence had borrowed from Menander. Now, uh, I, I expect you to remember the name of Menander, which is very easy to spell, and I'm going to put on the board the names of Plautus and Terence, two names uh, you really ought to remember.
Okay. We were talking about uh, 5th century BC Athens uh, with Menander. We came to the 4th century BC. Now we are 1st century BC with Plotus and Terence. Now, uh, what kind of uh, things uh, did uh, Elizabethan theater borrow from Roman comedy, which Roman comedy had borrowed from uh, the Greek new comedy, from Menander. Stock characters, stock situations, situation comedy, improbable events and surprises, intrigue, slapstick comedy. Do you know what slapstick comedy? Uh, slapstick comedy is broad humor, like a very self-important man, he's walking down the street and he happens to uh, you know, step on a banana peel and falls. That, that is slapstick comedy. Rapid action, double plots, okay? While the major protagonists are having their own affair, their servants, for example, have their own uh, plot going on. So that's double plot. Domestic themes, okay? Uh, I remind you that uh, neither in Roman times nor in Elizabethan times uh, was politics a safe subject to handle. In fact, uh, Elizabethan uh, theater had to be careful about censure because there was a, an institution called the Star Chamber which censured all the plays before they were allowed to be performed. And uh, when, when we speak of domestic themes, I have saved the last for the best, love and romance. All these things go into uh, Elizabethan comedy. In fact, Shakespeare himself uh, wrote two plays, and we'll talk about them in class uh, when we get to discuss the plays themselves, based on Roman models of Terence and Plotus. One of them was performed by the Propeller Company this summer in Istanbul, a comedy of errors. Okay, we said stock characters, stock types. What are stock characters, stock types? Uh, we, uh, you know, we have the young lover, he's a must. We have his clever servant. We have the cuckolded husband or the old man who is usually the young man's father, uh, both of them uh, trying to win the hand and the heart of the uh, young woman. We have the braggart soldier. Uh, we have the courtesan, you know, uh, two-dimensional types. OK, so. How about uh, uh, Roman, com uh, Roman tragedy? Now we can pass to uh, tragedy. Uh, the, uh, the, the one playwright we have to talk about is Seneca, first century, not BC, but this time AD, a statesman who wrote closet dramas. Uh, a statement who ended up suffering greatly, uh, being imprisoned and uh, committing suicide. Uh, he couldn't help it. He lived in the age of Nero. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, what's a closet uh, uh, drama? Uh, one not written to be performed, but to be read. Okay. Uh, so. And what did uh, uh, Seneca do? He borrowed plots, characters, and themes uh, from Greek drama, okay? And uh, since these are uh, closet dramas, it's mostly talk uh, with very little action. The illusion of action is created through words. All the tragedies of Seneca have five acts, thanks to Horace, who codified uh, Aristotle's observations on 
Greek theater and the chorus at the end of each act. But this chorus, uh, Seneca's chorus, has no integral part in the action. And in turn, all of uh, Seneca's themes and gimmicks were borrowed by Elizabethan dramatists. Uh, you will see this uh, when you read Hamlet, for example. Okay, revenge, the ghost of a wronged person, a bloody plot, characters torn between conflicting emotions, long static speeches, sensational events, and aroused passions. Same thing in England, same thing in France. Dime. Uh, and, you know, you could really have a lot of violence uh, because the violence would not be performed on stage and you could make things as bloody and violent as you like as long as these were simply to be read out in a closet. By the way, a closet is not something in which you hang clo uh, your clothes. A closet, until recently, meant a room. Okay? So these are room dramas. Okay, uh, Titus Andronicus by Shakespeare, one of his early plays, is probably one of the very best of these, uh, you know, passionate uh, and violent and bloody Senecan tragedies as ever written. As you know, uh, the drama towards the end of the Roman Empire degenerated into mere farce and spectacle. And what with the barbarians at the doors of Rome, the fall of the empire, the rise of Christian asceticism, from the 6th century to the 10th century, we have no theater as we know it, you know, something that we would recognize as uh, uh, theater and call theater. But as one uh, scholar has very aptly said, the actor survives without a stage. As a professional tale teller, as a minstrel, as an entertainer. You probably also know all about the uh, re rebirth of drama in the church during the Middle Ages and its slow secularization with sponsorship passing from church to, to the guilds. And you've probably heard uh, the terms mystery ploy, play, morality play, miracle play. With this increasing secularization, comedy enters the picture. Okay, for example, e e even in uh, plays uh, performed in church and during church festivals, uh, uh, if, if what was being performed was the story of Noah and his ark, we have comedy. Uh, we have uh, Noah's wife who wears the pants around the house or rather in the ark and who is always telling off her husband and scolding him. So. And uh, there is also an important character, and you will see him uh, in, for example, uh, uh, Marlowe's The Jew of Malta. He is called the, the Vice with a capital V. Vice is the funny devil. Why make the devil funny? Well, uh, laughter takes the sting out of fear, hence we have uh, the tradition of the funny devil. And, uh, you know, uh, he can be a Machiavellian type, as in Marlowe, or he can be, uh, you know, meliorated into your regular clown in other plays. Okay, so comedy has roots in. Uh, Terence and Plautus, who, who in turn have roots in Greek comedy. Uh, there is uh, the influence of, uh, uh, of uh, church-born drama in the Middle Ages. And Renaissance Italian comedy is also an influence on Elizabethan uh, uh, comedy, but a minor one. 
in, Italy, in Renaissance Italy, we have two kinds of comedy. And I will put their names down on the uh, uh, board for you. Commedia erudita and Commedia dell'arte. Believe it or not, this is an art. Okay, Commedia erudita, as the name implies, is learned plays, uh, erudite plays. They, they also go back to Terence and Plotus. Uh, and among its writers are Ariosto, with whom you are probably not familiar, and Machiavelli, with whom you are familiar. And you might think he only wrote The Prince. You're mistaken, he also wrote plays. And in Com Commedia dell'arte is very interesting. Uh, and it, it, it's something that uh, survived from the Renaissance to the 18th century. It's improvised comedy performed by traveling players based on stock scenarios and skeleton plots and making use of uh, stock characters. And they traveled all over the place. La language seems to have been no barrier. You find them in England, you find them in France, you find them all over Europe. Now, what have we got uh, at the beginning of the 16th century in England before the remarkable flowering of Elizabethan drama? We have the morality plays. Remember the morality plays from the Middle Ages? They were still very popular during the 16th century. They are uh, what? They are allegories in dramatic form. Uh, and uh, the characters are personified abstractions acting out the struggle between good and evil in man's soul. OK? And these could end one of two ways. Uh, uh, either with the soul being saved or being damned. And the most famous of, of these is a play called Every Man. And this sort of mo morality play is called a psychomachia. I'll put that one too on the board because it's difficult to uh, remember and to spell. Psychomachia. And if you ever come across Marlowe's uh, Dr. Faustus, uh, you will remember Psychomachia. Okay, uh, but even some of these um, moralities had comic elements, like the liturgical plays. Remember Noah's wife? Uh, and uh, they also had Vice, the funny devil. And uh, they combine serious themes with uh, caricature and slapstick. What else did we have in the, in the earlier 16th century? We had plays called interludes. Interludes. Interludes are short plays designed to be played as entertainment at banquets. They, they can be serious or they can be farcical. And then, there are masks, not spelt uh, like this, but like that. OK. A mask is a courtly kind of entertainment. Uh, it's song, dance, lavish costumes. It is today what we would call a show, uh, an extraordinary spectacle. And it was introduced into England from Italy, like many of these things. Uh, they have almost no plot or dramatic interest. The action, what, what little action there is, simply serves as a vehicle to carry the spectacle. Now, uh, 
we have a mask actually in one of Shakespeare's plays. The Tempest has a mask in it. So uh, the long and the short of it is that Elizabethan comedy not only had classical uh, roots, but roots in the native tradition, in the uh, morality, mystery, and miracle plays. Okay? In tragedy, on the other hand, there are no native models. The influence of the Roman model is intense. Uh, I, I repeat again, the, uh, the English had no access in the 16th century uh, to the actual Greek texts, but knew them through Roman imitations. So, if we are to look for uh, native elements in uh, Elizabethan tragedy, we have to look not in drama, but in non-dramatic narratives. Uh, in the Middle Ages, any story which ended unhappily with death was considered a tragedy, whether it was in dramatic form or not, uh, uh, because like us, uh, they did not restrict the term comedy and tragedy to drama, they used it loosely. Of these medieval texts, which served as uh, you know, antecedents for Elizabethan tragedy, the most important is the mirror for magistrates, okay? Uh, the magistrate is supposed to read uh, this text which serves as a mirror, uh, see what might happen to him if his fortune changed. The, the uh, mirror for magistrates is a collection of versified stories about men of high station falling into misery and death due to a downward turn in the wheel of fortune. So, uh, they are warning stories. They felt that these stories accorded well with Aristotle had said of tragedy. The fall of a great man through some kind of fall. Uh, Aristotle talks of hamartia. What is hamartia? It's uh, human error. It's an uh, error of judgment. But, of course, uh, when he was translated later by Christian translators, particularly Castel Vetro in Italy in the uh, very early 16th century, or was it the 15th? I don't quite remember. But anyway, because, because of their Christian, uh, the Christian coloring of their thought, uh, they concentrated on hubris, pride, which is a sin in terms of Christianity. And let this serve as a warning to you about the dangers of translation. The translator's own milieu and mindset have a lot to do with how he uh, or she translates a text. For example, in early translations of Aristotle in English, you see the word hero. Poor Aristotle, he never used the word hero. Uh, and uh, in fact, he said, drama is action. And he further said, you can have action without character. Well, what did he mean? He meant that the agents who are acting out the plot do not deserve the name of character um, until they are shown to make a a moral choice. Only then does an agent become a character. So it's best not to talk about heroes, but simply about protagonists. OK, where was I? OK, uh, playwriting as we know it, OK? Up until now, we've been talking about what's going on in England in the 16th century, and none of them are really uh, plays that uh, we would immediately call a play in the modern sense. Playwriting in the modern sense first flourishes where? In the universities, of course, and it's not written by professors, but by students. Okay? And, uh, 
something uh, interesting happens in 1560. Two university people, uh, Sackville and Norton, write a play called Gorboduk. in blank verse, okay? It's Norton and Sackville who introduce blank verse into drama, uh, which Marlowe adopts and which Shakespeare adopts. Most of Shakespeare's plays are uh, in blank verse with prose passages. In fact, if you uh, ma make a statistical count, comedies contain uh, more prose than a verse, and the tragedies contain more verse than prose. By the 1560s, we see something else, the establishment of uh, theater companies. At this moment, we still don't have a building called a theater, but we have the establishment of theater companies. And so plays at first were performed wherever there was a convenient place and an audience. They could be performed in the open air, in the houses of the rich, in guild halls, in inn yards, at schools, at the inns of court, wherever. In 15... In uh, 1567, in 1567, a man called uh, James Burbage erects the first theater. And what does he call this building which he erects? The theater. Okay, so the first theater is in uh, England is called the theater. Uh, Shakespeare was also a member of a theater company. He worked with the same company throughout his career, but it sounds like two, uh, because we talk about uh, uh, because we talk about uh, his work with Lord Chamberlain's men, men and with the King's men. Uh, what happened is that uh, it's the same company, but in 1603, with the, uh, with the death of Queen Elizabeth I and the coming to the throne of James I, uh, the company simply changed name. And what used to be the Lord Chamberlain's uh, uh, men becomes now the King's men. Shakespeare and come, by the way, Shakespeare was a shareholder in the company. He wrote many of the plays and he acted some of the parts. He wasn't good looking enough to play uh, Romeo or Hamlet, but he played many of the character parts, as well as uh, you know, uh, writing the plays and uh, taking care of the finances of the theater. The company uh, at first was uh, uh, using a rented place, a rented theater. Uh, soon they built their own theater, the Globe Theater, which you see uh, in figure three. The Globe, the world is a stage, uh, that's also by Shakespeare is an open-roofed round theater. It's actually octagonal, not perfectly round, but it's the, uh, we call it an open-roofed round theater. It was made of wood. It was very large. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, it had a platform stage elevated from the ground and projecting into the audience. No curtains. That's why the corpses had to carry it out, okay? Because dead man can't rise. Uh, 
in, in some of the theatres in London, there was an inner stage with a curtain and sometimes the, uh, you know, the scene building at the back had a balcony uh, so that Juliet could come onto the balcony and talk to Romeo. Okay, now, uh, this platform stage was protected by a roof and uh, that roof was also the heavens, okay? And the stage itself represented the earth, the world, and the space beneath the stage, remember this is an elevated stage, the space beneath the stage represented hell. And there were trapdoors in the stage uh, through which uh, devils and evil characters could uh, enter and exit. And they really used the heavens well. They had a system of wires and pulleys and you could see, uh, you know, uh, deities and other things floating in the heavens above the stage. Okay, uh, the theater was one of the most popular forms of entertainment uh, during the uh, time of Queen Elizabeth and James I. Uh, around 15,000 spectators went to the theater per week, okay? And plays were performed practically all year around, sometimes even into a cold January or a cold fe February, but they were closed during summer in London because of the plague, okay? People in a theater are sitting in such close quarters that, you know, the, the, and plague being so infectious, they closed down the theaters. Well, uh, the players weren't idle during the summer months. They toured the country, okay? And sometimes they were even invited to perform at court. We know of several such uh, court performances by Shakespeare's company and by other companies. Uh, how about B the Blackfriars Theater? It's an indoor theater. It's much smaller and the tickets are more expensive, okay? And uh, of course, because it's, it's a closed space, it has to be uh, lighted by artificial means so that there are uh, intermissions during which the chandeliers are pulled down, uh, the wicks of the um, candles replaced, and then the performance continues. In open air theaters, on the other hand, there is no intermission. The play begins and runs to the end. Okay, so that, that's a great difference. In uh, in the Globe Theater, there were no intermissions. Uh, once begun, the play just went on, and performances lasted about two and a half hours. Okay, so. Imagine 15,000 people going to the theater every week, uh, a very popular form of entertainment, yet acting was regarded with suspicion and condemned as immoral by the Puritans. The Puritans were very much uh, around uh, by then and they were censored by the Star Chamber. Uh, yet there were famous stars Remember we talked about uh, Burbage who had built the theater? Well, his son, Richard Burbage, and look at his picture, uh, Richard Burbage was uh, one of two uh, very famous tragic actors. He worked with Shakespeare's com company, whereas Edward Alin, worked with a rival company and uh, the two most famous comic actors of the time were Will Kemp and Robert Armin. Okay, uh, 
both men worked with Shakespeare's company and uh, Will Kemp was great at improvisation, slapstick comedy, clowning of all sorts. And it's apparent that Shakespeare, uh, you know, uh, wrote some of the parts for the kind of talents which Will Kemp uh, had. And after he left the company, uh, Robert Armin joined as clown. And then you find Shakespeare writing more intellectual clowns like Festi in the Twelfth Night, so that uh, you can see how uh, you know, the particular skills and talents of actors could actually affect the way a playwright who, who was in daily contact with them wrote his plays. Now, boys played the young women's parts. Older women were probably played by adult men. Uh, uh, audiences uh, did not find this troubling. Uh, uh, what did Coleridge say about the reception of art? It needs the willing suspension of disbelief. Well, uh, when you go in, uh, into Musin Arturul Theater in Harbie, if you can believe that the stage is Elsinore and uh, uh, the actor playing Hamlet is actually Hamlet, uh, you could, I, I suppose, also believe that a man playing a woman was a woman. Okay? Today, directors are requiring even greater uh, imaginative participation uh, from us. You find African-American Antonies, you find uh, African-American Lears or Mirandas, you can find Asian-American Ophelias and multicultural Lears daughters. So nothing has changed much as far as the demands made on us, uh, imaginative demands made on us by uh, directors. Okay. The uh, Elizabethan platform stage was almost bare, almost bare. Almost no uh, stage props, no furniture. Sometimes, you know, uh, they, they would paint a few flowers on a board and that would uh, represent a garden. Or uh, there, there would be a tomb and that would uh, presumably represent a uh, temple or they would put an ornate chair, it could be uh, a palace. So, uh, how, how, how were the scenes localized? Through words, through words. There, there was no stage uh, furniture to localize the place. Localization was through words. And uh, I remind you again that like the Greek plays and like the Roman plays in the globe, uh, uh, the, an open air theater, uh, they used natural light. They, they performed in natural light. So in the absence of any kind of artificial lighting, there was no possibility of darkening the stage or creating visual effects. How then did they indicate light and darkness? Uh, they, they, they indicated them symbolically uh, by carrying candles or torches onto the stage or wearing their bedclothes or simply saying how dark it is tonight. Okay? Uh, and the same thing, you know, uh, when uh, the two girls arrive in the forest of Arden, how do we know that they have left uh, uh, the mansion and now reached uh, the forest of Arden, they simply say, ah, thank God we are finally in the forest of Arden. And that's the way uh, uh, they localized the scene. Because each company had a limited number of players, remember companies have to pay salaries uh, to players, Wars and other cr uh, crowd scenes were uh, presented in stylized form. 
For example, if two armies were fighting, there would be two actors on one side and two actors uh, on the other side, and these four warriors would fight to the sound of uh, drums and uh, uh, trumpets and cannons, and this was considered enough to represent a war. Uh, on this bare stage, we have extremely elaborate costumes, absolutely lavish costumes. Uh, some of them uh, originally belonged to aristocrats who discarded them. They would either give directly to the theater or they would give it to their servants and the servants in turn would sell it to the theater companies. And uh, did they care for historical accuracy uh, as far as costumes went? No, they did not. Uh, it was very uh, anachronistic, except for a couple of costumes for uh, Romans. You know, Roman characters wore toga, Turks and Jews, and of course virgins who always wore white. And uh, you could always tell somebody was a ghost uh, because a ghost always wore leather. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, you will see in a figure uh, a drawing, uh, a, uh, a contemporary drawing of, uh, of a performance of Julius Caesar and the main actors will be dressed in togas but the rest of them are in everyday Elizabethan dress. Okay? They dressed in modern costume. And of course there was the titillating idea of cross-dressing. Okay? Uh, what is cross-dressing? Uh, you know, a male actor playing a woman has to disguise as a man as a protection, as is the case in Twelfth Night with Viola. She's shipwrecked, finds herself in a strange land, and since life is difficult for maidens, he decides to pose as a man. So here you have a male actor playing a woman's part, but the woman uh, is disguised as a man. Okay, that's cross-dressing. What kind of stage effects did they have? Ooh, they were able to produce a great many stage effects uh, in the attic of the scene building. Uh, they could uh, uh, produce thunder, cannon, and uh, I told you already that supernatural beings were flying in the heavens suspended from wires and pulleys, and there was always music. There was always music. And the musicians sat to one side of the stage in their own gallery. Uh, on, the, uh, on the side across from the musicians were the most expensive seats, which hardly saw the stage at all. And yet they were the expensive seats uh, because the, uh, the cultivated elite went to hear a play rather than to see a play. So uh, in Shakespeare's plays too, you find characters saying, let's hear a play rather than go to a play or watch a play or see a play. Okay, what were the conventions of uh, acting like? Okay, uh, it must have been pretty strenuous uh, acting on an Elizabethan stage. A, there are no intermissions. B, it's in broad daylight. And if, if this is the, the platform stage which projects into the audience, the audience are sitting in several rows surrounding uh, the stage and they are also covered by a roof. But this bit around the stage is uncovered. It's open to rain. And those are the cheapest tickets. If you buy the cheapest ticket, uh, you can watch the play standing up around the, uh, around the stage. And those people were called the groundlings. Uh, just so their feet wouldn't get wet, they, they would strew the ground, which was made of earth, 
uh, with uh, with uh, uh, hazelnut rinds, and uh, uh, those came uh, uh, from this part of the world. In fact, uh, in 1999, when the new globe was opened, uh, hazelnut uh, were flown from uh, Trabzon to cover the floor. Okay. An Elizabethan theater wasn't a very quiet place, especially the groundlings uh, did everything possible to distract the authors. And while the performance was going on in broad daylight, uh, you know, a girl selling oranges moved uh, all around the place. Why oranges rather than something else? Because an orange was very useful. You could eat it, you could suck it, you could hold it against your nose in order to block out the smell coming from other human beings sitting next to you. And after you had eaten it, you could throw the pips on the stage if you didn't like the play. So or oranges were part and parcel of the performance. So uh, how, how did these poor actors manage? We really don't know. Uh, were they trained in rhetoric, for example, or did they use uh, broad gestures while acting like this and like that, okay, as in later melodrama, or did they use facial gestures? Did they use a different style of acting for the globe versus the Blackfriars, i.e. for the huge open-air theatres and the closed, intimate, indoor theatres? Uh, we have no way of knowing, but we know that they had to be good sportsmen, good swordsmen, because all these, uh, they had to be physically very agile because uh, the parts required all those physical skills. Uh, rehearsals, now this will really come as a surprise. Actors rehearsed by themselves. There was no director. Uh, but simply someone uh, who was in charge of the performance and who probably did some directorial work. In Shakespeare's company, since he was both playwright and actor and shareholder, it's possible that he might have uh, ful uh, filled the role of stage manager. And don't think that, uh, you know, uh, Hamlet got the full text of Hamlet to take home and to memorize and to rehearse. Each actor was given only his own lines. Uh, the plays weren't printed, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Okay, so, and uh, each, each of them had a, a manuscript with only his own lines. The other characters' lines were only indicators as prompts as to what our act, uh, as to when our actor uh, was to speak. Anyway, there wasn't much time for rehearsals uh, uh, in a company which put on 40 different plays every year. Such companies uh, which, uh, which uh, put on many, many plays during a season are known as repertory companies, uh, nowadays called rep. repertory companies. Okay. Who was the audience? The audience was made up of men and women from all classes, from the highest to the lowest, and the tickets were priced accordingly. And, uh, you know, d their ears were more attuned to listening to verse than our ears are. And uh, one scholar said Shakespeare was able to please many palates with the same dish. Okay? Uh, you know, uh, if, if, if you were uh, an educated person uh, who loved uh, great ideas and great verse, you might want to listen to Hamlet's soliloquies. That would be the reason why you went uh, to hear Hamlet. But if you were a groundling and you were working for an artisan, 
uh, you, you probably went to see if and when he would kill his father's murderer. So he was able to please with one single dish many different palates indeed. The texts. Shakespeare wrote his plays as performance texts uh, not to be read or studied in class, but to be performed on the stage, okay? Uh, he wrote in longhand and uh, as as member of the company, he could always uh, cut, change, or add to what he had written, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, if 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 the man if the handwritten manuscript was uh, you know full of scribbles and notes in the margin and uh, hardly legible, they are called foul papers. And if for a change he had written carefully and legibly, they were known as fair copies. A, a, a playwright gave his play to the company and lost all copyright over it. Uh, from then on. In fact, the idea of copyright had not been born. And uh, the, the, the minute he gave the play to the company, the owner of the play was the company, no longer the author himself. Why, why were these plays never printed by the company? Uh, because they didn't want rival companies uh, to possess the plays, as simple as that. Uh, so, they didn't want the text to be printed. They didn't want uh, to give their competitors access to the script. The companies allowed publication only if, uh, or only if a, a you know, bad quarto had appeared. Otherwise, uh, they, would, uh, they would keep them uh, safe in the company house, okay? Uh, uh, at other times, uh, they would allow uh, printing uh, if the pirated printing uh, was so bad, uh, they wanted to show the world that the actual play wasn't so bad. Some of these unauthorized printings are referred to as good quartos and others, as I said, are known as bad quartos. And good quartos I, are, were either printed from Shakespeare's own uh, manuscripts or from the prompt books which had to be renewed uh, uh, occasionally. What's a prompt book? You know what's a prompter? Uh, somebody uh, who assists uh, the actors if they forget their lines. And, uh, you know, uh, the bookkeeper who kept the prompt book uh, wrote on it all the entrances, all the exits, all the stage directions, and the special effects. Okay? Uh, the bad quartos, uh, you know, th they had a strange way of uh, getting into print. An actor who had memorized his own part would have a pretty good idea of what the other actors' lines were, so they were usually printed from actors' memories. Uh, I suppose I should also tell you what's a quarto and what's a folio. This is a printer sheet. If I fold it once, I get four reasonably large pages. Give me one, two, and three, and four. This is a folio. What happens when I fold it again? I've got eight small pages, okay? So that's folio, four pages, and that's quarto, eight small pages. Okay. I told you that Shakespeare uh, made revisions, rewrote certain sections, uh, cut, added, amended, etc. Uh, and uh, sometimes the actor might demand cuts or changes. 
For example, the complete Hamlet would have taken certainly more than the two and a half hours which were allowed for any play in the Globe Theatre. So we, we know for sure that it must have been cut for performance. So if, if you could play uh, with the text like this, you can uh, easily say that these were fluid texts, not fixed texts. Uh, so there is, uh, there is an instability uh, uh, to the text. So we are talking about a fluid text, uh, which, which makes an editor's job very dif difficult. Uh, the editor puts the, the folio edition on one side, the uh, variorum editions, which brings together the good uh, and the uh, bad uh, for, uh, quartos. And uh, he also has his favorite uh, good quartos and bad quartos on the table with him. He then compares the texts, notes the differences, the variations. He collates, he amends, he literally has to create a new text. Then he sits down and writes the notes uh, and puts in uh, carefully all the act and scene divisions. Of course, when Shakespeare wrote his plays, uh, he didn't put in any act or scene divisions. He simply wrote the play from uh, beginning to end. Uh, so what's the upshot of this editorial process? It is that no two texts of Shakespeare's uh, plays are alike. Scene endings can be different. Uh, uh, act, uh, you know, acts uh, might uh, begin or end at different places. Line numbering differs. Interpretation of words differ. And of course, the plays are not the same length. Edition A may have 20 more lines than uh, which B doesn't have. And edition B may include 55 lines, which edition A leaves out. For example, compare uh, the kind of text we have nowadays. The Arden Shakespeare, the Oxford Shakespeare, the Penguin Shakespeare, the Signet Shakespeare, the Folger Library Shakespeare. Look at the same play. Look at Twelfth Night, for example. If you look at uh, the Arden texts, uh, the play runs to 450 lines. And uh, if you look at the Penguin text, it's only 384 lines. So this shows you that each new edition of Shakespeare is in, uh, in some sense a recreation of the text depending on the choices made by the editor. And oh, when we get to Hamlet, you will see that the differences are far more great than what we just said about the Twelfth Night. Okay. In 1642, we have the closing of the theaters, don't we? Uh, and uh, in 1660, with the rest restoration, the theaters uh, reopen and we have women players on the stage. And adaptations of Shakespeare start, for example, in the 18th century, they thought Shakespeare had it all wrong, that uh, he didn't exercise poetic justice. Romeo and Juliet shouldn't die. Lear and his daughter should live happily ever after. So they changed the endings of the plays uh, to, to accord with uh, poetic justice. I just gave you the example of the 18th century to show you that each age reads and produces Shakespeare differently. Up to this point, we have talked about the context in which Shakespeare wrote his plays. But what about the man himself? Who was Shakespeare? Never mind all the various fictions and fabrications about his identity, that Shakespeare didn't write his own plays, that he was this and he was that. Uh, Shakespeare is a real man. Now we know quite a lot about his life from contemporary records which have survived. He was born in 
Stratford upon Avon in 1564, and you can see his the house, the house in which he was born. His father wasn't, uh, you know, uh, an un uneducated poor peasant. He was a relatively prosperous craftsman and served as alderman and town major. Shakespeare is not unschooled. He attended Stratford Grammar School. Right next to it is the church. and uh, You can see the uh, Stratford Grammar School there. And in that school, students studied Latin, rhetoric, logic, and literature, as well as math, of course. And uh, obviously, Shakespeare must have been uh, acquainted with Roman dramatists in Stratford Grammar School with Plautus, Terence, and Seneca. Uh, in fact, you can see their influence in the plays, sometimes verbatim, sometimes Shakespeare will talk about Horace or uh, some other Roman writer. Obviously, he was familiar with them. He married Anne Hathaway in 1582 when he was 18, and their uh, first child was born only seven months after uh, the wedding took place. So you can see that it was a rather hasty marriage. There's a gap in our records for the next five years. Uh, what did he do in those five years? When, uh, when did he go up to London and start writing? We don't know. What we do know is that by 1590, Shakespeare is in London, already an established playwright and an actor. And soon to become famous with his poems, with the sonnets and his uh, two long poems. Shakespeare lived and worked in London, but kept in close contact with his wife and children in Stratford. He had several children, one of whom, Hammett, died while he was a very young boy. Shakespeare did uh, earn money from his uh, theatrical activities, and he invested the money he earned from the theater in his hometown buying real estate in Stratford. And in the picture, you can see uh, the library of the house which Shakespeare bought. Of course, the library wasn't so fancy when Shakespeare had bought the house. Now it's a museum, so it has been uh, somewhat decorated. In 1610, when he was 46 years old, he returns to Stratford and spends the last six years of his life there with occasional business trips to London. And he dies there in 1616. Uh, it's uh, interesting that uh, we think he was born and he died on the 23rd of April. So it's easy to remember. Of course, I expect you to remember his dates, 1564-1660. Okay. And, uh, you know, the proud citizens of Stratford put up a monument in the church in honor of their uh, famous uh, playwright. Uh, it's an awful looking monument, but there it is. Uh, Th that's the church right next to the grammar school, which you, sh which you saw in an earlier picture. Now, coming from the man to his works. We can date many, but not all of his plays from contemporary records and documents. His career as a playwright spans 20 years, I would say roughly from uh, 1590 to uh, 1611 or 1612. He wrote a total of 36 plays, and this number 36 does not include his collaborations and his disputed plays. Uh, but uh, uh, we know that uh, at the end of his career, he collaborated with John Fletcher in 1612, uh, 1613, to write two more plays, Henry VIII and Two Noble Kinsmen. 
I told you earlier, and I will repeat this because I want you to remember it, that Shakespeare worked all his life with the same uh, theatre company, Lord Chamberlain's man, whose name became the King's Man in 1603. Uh, I also want you to remember both the Globe and the Blackfriars, because that's where uh, his plays were performed. Uh, we also talked about, uh, you know, the bad quartos, the good quartos, and f uh, what a folio was. Now it's time to look at the first folio. The first folio uh, was uh, published by two of his actor friends from his own company. Their names are John Hemmings and Henry Condell. This is the first complete edition of his uh, plays. Uh, it's called The First Folio. Its date is 1623. Okay? Shakespeare, as you know, writes in early modern English. That's why we have so many notes and uh, ex explanatory passages in the editions that you read. Uh, uh, how are uh, Sh Shakespeare's plays are categorized in the following way: comedies, tragedies, English histories, Roman plays, and romances. But uh, you know, basically, his history plays, and uh, uh, whether they are English histories or Roman histories, are tragedies, and his romances can be categorized under comedy. One other interesting thing about Shakespeare is that uh, he did not invent his own plots. Uh, he based the plots, the story outlines of practically all his plays on existing histories, pseudo-histories, legends, stories. He read a lot. He read a lot. For example, uh, uh, for Hamlet, his sources uh, Saxo Grammaticus, History of the Danes. It's part history and part legend. Uh, by the way, we also think that he could read some French and some Italian, although he usually did, uh, appears to have used English translations of French and Italian texts. When, when we uh, read uh, the various plays, we will have occasion to talk about Shakespeare's sources. I, I also spoke about the nature of Shakespeare's audience, Dime, that the Globe uh, Theatre included, uh, the audience at the Globe Theatre included men and women, young and old, rich and poor, educated and uneducated. Uh, these people obviously enjoyed these plays because they paid uh, for tickets uh, to watch them. But for 400 years later, we still enjoy them. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's good to stop and think why we enjoy them uh, after 400 years. And uh, all over the world, Shakespeare, uh, several Shakespeare plays are being produced practically every year in every town that has a theater. In fact, Japan has built its own globe theater. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, famous actors uh, die to play uh, Shakespeare roles. Actors make their whole careers on playing Hamlet or uh, Lear or whatever. Film versions and film adaptations abound. Again, uh, I'll give the example from Japan. Uh, Akiro Kurosawa's Ran, which is the Japanese adaptation of Macbeth. And very interestingly, the plays always find new editors, therefore we have new editions coming out practically every other year, and new translators. And publishing houses always keep the plays in print, both in English and in translation. This means there are quite a few people who are ready uh, to pay good money to buy those texts to read them. So there is and always has been a market for Shakespeare. 
Uh, what's the reason behind his enduring popularity, not only in English-speaking lands, but everywhere, including Turkey? He's performed and read, I think, because his play texts are not closed texts uh, designed to give us a message. That is, they don't reduce human experience to a simple paradigm. Uh, his, his plays are open texts which invite us to make our own interpretations. What he offers us is not a neat fictional world where black and white are clearly marked. On the contrary, Shakespeare presents us uh, with life as we know it and as we live it. Life in all its complexity, mystery, ambiguity. He does not offer answers and poses questions. And many of those questions involve issues which are still current today. I think that's the secret behind Shakespeare's popularity. Before I finish this uh, introductory lecture, I want to make a, a few general comments about his comedies and his tragedies. And under comedies, I also include the romances. And under the tragedies, I also include the Roman histories and the English histories. How are we going to deal with uh, Shakespeare's comedies and tragedies in class? We are going to do close readings of the texts remembering that they are performance texts. And we are going to look at structure, action, language, and of course the themes Shakespeare explores, and also his characters. But you will notice that uh, we'll be able to discuss uh, some comedies uh, without talking very much about character. Why? Because Shakespeare's comic uh, plays are based on comic situations and comic types, uh, not on character, uh, although he did create an unforgettable Malvolio and an unforgettable uh, Shylock. Again, in some of the uh, early tragedies, we don't talk that much about character. For Take Romeo and Juliet. Uh, these young people were victims of their circumstances, uh, of factors outside of their own control. The feud was not of their own making. But when we get to Ham Hamlet, Macbeth, or to Antony and Cleopatra, we have lots of room to talk about the characters because their tragedies are basically rooted in themselves. Uh, it, uh, tragedy arises out of character. If they had personalities other than the ones they have, they wouldn't, uh, there wouldn't be tragedy in their lives. This is not to say that circumstances play no part, but given those circumstances, tragedy occurs because they have these particular personalities. For example, if Hamlet's character uh, was like that of Laertes, he would go and kill Claudius immediately, and the play would end at the end of Act One. So, uh, it's a mixture of circumstance and character. I also want to say a few words about Shakespeare's endings. And this ties in with the idea that his texts are open texts, and that he doesn't offer us a world of black and white. Order seems to be uh, restored at the end of both the comedies and the tragedies. Uh, Shakespeare's comedies, in fact, end with one or several marriages. The villains are driven out and harmony is established, uh, usually symbolized by a dance. But is it? How will these marriages turn out? What guarantee do we have that Oberon and Titania in A Midsummer Night's Dream won't quarrel again? Uh, or what guarantee do we have that Demetrius and Lysander won't change their minds again? Uh, how good is love at first sight uh, a sound reason to get married? 
His tragedies also end with order restored. Or do they? Are we sure that the feud will not break out again in the Verona of Romeo and Juliet? What will happen in Denmark now that it's fallen to Fortinbras? Will it no longer be a prison or what? Is Scotland never going to experience another civil war? Uh, are there no new uh, Macbeths uh, hiding in the wings? No wonder one of Shakespeare's favorite uh, themes was appearance versus reality. Uh, in either the comedies or the tragedies, we can ask this question. Is the finale for real or is it seeming harmony? That's something to think about as we read the place.